my name's Ryan Holland. Uh, I lead one of the security teams here on our Guard Duty Service, which is part of our external security services team. And when we say evolving beyond heroics for threat detection and incident response, we're really talking about moving from a situation where you have individual analysts that have to triage and respond to every single security alert, and more moving towards a situation where you've employed automation to handle a lot of the alerts for you and also the actions that you're gonna take. So for the first part of this talk, I'll be covering some of the best practices for enabling uh, automation through our external security services. And then I'll be joined by uh, Bill Shin, who's a senior principal in our office of the CISO, to talk about some of the resources that are available to customers for incident response, as well as some of the common root causes for security events that they're seeing in the field and ways that you can try to avoid them. So if you're not familiar with uh, external security services, this is our, a team within AWS. And from the, at the high level, we create services that are designed to help our customers protect their AWS environments. So we currently have five services that you can see here on the screen, uh, from threat detection, as well as uh, doing um, configuration monitoring, as well as um, Macy for sense of data discovery and Inspector for vulnerability analysis. For today's talk, we're really gonna cover the guard duty detective and security hub as the most relevant for threat detection and incident response. So before I dig into some of the best practices for those services though, I do wanna cover off some high level best practices that are for more related to account management and just kind of good housekeeping that are gonna be required if you want to enable automation through uh, these events. Uh, and the first one is really to understand your environment. Right? So for example, in AWS, if I go to create a new account for myself, I'm asked a series of questions, and these are all logged and stored in a queryable data store that lets us understand what is the use of this particular account. Is it going to contain production data or is it for non-production? Also, who owns this account? Who should we contact if there's an issue? And what is the sensitivity or the data type that this account is going to process? Is this going to contain customer data, for example, or does it contain business critical data? And the answer to these questions is really important when you go to try to implement the automation. And also, if it does reach an actual human responder, having this readily queryable is also going to really help them and reduce the amount of time that it takes for them to respond because they won't be trying to go to an Excel sheet, for example, to figure out, well, what's in that account and who owns it. The second part of this is tagging, right? So uh, on the resource level. And this becomes very important also if you have accounts where you have multiple groups using the same account. And it's important that your tagging strategy both be consistent and enforced. Again, if you want to enable automation, you need to expect the same types of values in all of your accounts across the organization. So some useful things to make sure that you include is who, who is the owner for this resource, right? If, if automation needs to send someone a ticket or if someone in your SOC needs to reach out to somebody, having that uh, readily available to them so they know where to go contact is important. Also, what is the use, what is the purpose of that particular resource? Um, and what is the data sensitivity that it, that it handles? And what are its availability requirements? Uh, the last one's really important if you think about how I might respond through automation for a stateless web server, for example, that's part of an auto scaling group, is gonna be materially different from an instance that maybe contains data that's very stateful. And then the last one is to leverage a feature that we have worked with our organization's teams on called the delegated administrator. Kind of comes down to the idea that you cannot protect what you don't monitor. Right? If you're not looking for something, you're never gonna be able to see it. And so within the ESS team, we've adopted this delegated administrator functionality across our services, which allow you to manage and control the services centrally from a single administrator account. This is very useful also when it comes time to do automation because I now only need to collect the output from those services from that one single administrator account versus trying to collect it from all of my other accounts. We also have a feature of part of this that we call auto enable, which is very much as it sounds, it automatically enables the service. And this removes some of the kind of heavy lifting of making sure that you bootstrap all your accounts when you create new ones and setting up that uh, administrator and member relationship. With auto enable turned on, automatically whenever a new account is created or joins your organization, it'll automatically have these security services enabled. They'll automatically made a member to those accounts without having to do, again, any sort of post-account creation scripting, which means that you won't have any accounts that end up getting missed. 
So if we kind of move on to the guard duty best practices, a few things to help um, when it comes time to implement this automation. So the first one is to identify and suppress things that are expected in your environment. Right? So we've done a lot of work over the last 18 months on really reducing the amount of findings we generate. We really want the findings that we produce to be very high quality and actionable. But there is still situations where you might have expected behavior within your environment that matches one of the rules. So one common example we see is if you're running a, uh, one of our partner tools to do something like a vulnerability assessment that does a port scan. That's going to trigger a port scan finding. We added into the, the product the ability to create suppression rules. And these suppression rules can be very narrow and very focused, if you wish, to allow you to identify based on maybe the tag or the AMI ID and the specific finding type that you want to suppress. And again, through that delegated administrator functionality, you can do this centrally and have it apply to all of your accounts. By identifying and suppressing this otherwise uh, benign or expected activity, you ultimately reduce the amount of alerts that are going to reach your automation and ultimately possibly reach a human responder as well. The second one is to leverage severity for prioritization. So I, I've talked to a lot of customers in my role, and I've heard several times where people tell me, well, we only really look at the high severity findings. And, and I think it's really important to understand that the severity rating that we give to a particular event is rated to the criticality of the event that we saw. But today's lower medium finding could very well lead to tomorrow's high. So it's, it's important to not just simply ignore and completely um, you know, disregard lower severity findings. Um, you want to definitely action on the higher severity ones first, but simply ignoring or deleting uh, the lower severity findings removes your opportunity to take action on an event, maybe before it gets to a more critical stage. The third one is operationalizing the features, right? So uh, simply turning on the service doesn't help you out unless you're actually getting information out of it. And so while we, we you know, encourage people to leverage the console to go and view and look at the findings, you don't want the, the, your response to be tied to having somebody happen to be logged into the console at a particular moment in time. So we leverage EventBridge that allows us to send notifications out through the event bridge that can trigger uh, downstream notifications or automations. Um, also, as we'll talk about later, you can leverage Security Hub to do this as well and centralize where you're doing these actions from. But it's important that you're actually doing something with these findings and getting them out into the hands of those downstream toolings or someone who's going to be able to take action on them. The fourth one is defining how you're going to respond to a particular finding. So the time to understand and, and define how you're going to respond to a particular event is well before that event takes place. If you're trying to figure out what you need to do when the finding happens, it's far too late. Um, and also, one, one of the other challenges we see people come up with is we have a lot of different findings. So we have over 70 different findings in GuardDuty. But ultimately, they fall into certain categories. So an instance compromise, a user compromise, or, or a bucket compromise. And so a lot of times, you can reduce the number of actual playbooks that you need to define based on the different categories that there are there. And define the set of runbooks that you want and codify those. It might not be that you're going to have it be completely automated. But if you have a human that's going to execute a runbook or an automation, you want it to be done through code such that those actions are always consistently done the same way every time. And the fifth one is start small, right? Um, one of the other challenges I've seen people think is, well, it's going to take me a long time to figure out an automation strategy for all of these different findings. And that's absolutely true. Um, when we started operationalizing findings internally from GuardDuty, we didn't do every single finding at once. We started with a small subset of very impactful findings built those strategies, understood how those are going to work, and then added new ones over time. So don't think that you have to be able to operationalize every single finding right away. And then lastly, one of our other services, uh, Amazon Detective, can be very useful if you do need to do a deeper dive and understand root cause and what else happened for part of an event. So within GuardDuty, you can pivot directly into Detective. And it has a lot of information that's very useful for understanding what happened before and what happened after a particular finding. 
So for example, a lot of times, if guard duty is telling you that there's a problem with an instance, you might want to know, well, how did that happen? What, where did the intrusion take place? Or what other activities took place on that instance after the finding was generated? Was there attempts at lateral movement? Was there other communications? And to do that, you need to have access to a lot of telemetry, things like flow logs or cloud trail data. And Amazon Detective has readily available for you 12 months of historical data, as well as baselines and playbooks that you can run through to do an investigation. So it's very useful for those times when you do need to dive deep into a particular finding and understand, again, what happened before, how did this take place, and what other activities were possibly done by that user or by that instance. So kind of going back to the theme of prioritizing and starting small, when I, when I talk about it to a lot of our customers and I tell them that, oftentimes they'll say, that's great, where should we start? Um, so I put together a list of the different finding types that if I was to start building a uh, remediation schedule, I would start with these. So the first one is the instance credential exfiltration finding. Um, this is telling you essentially that the credentials that were assigned through an STS role to your instance have been exfiltrated outside of AWS and they're being used. And those, those credentials are really meant to be used on that instance. This often is a key indicator that someone has compromised an application on that host or the, or the instance itself. Uh, the next one are related to command and control. So command and control servers are leveraged by a lot of uh, active malware. And so these findings can be indicative of uh, a malware that's on that host and it's communicating out to a command and control server to either issue commands or to send data. The third one's related to Tor. So uh, Tor allows you to obfuscate or hide the source of, of your traffic. And there's really no valid business reason to ever interface with an AWS API endpoint through a Tor exit node, for example. Uh, similarly, there's very few good reasons why one of your instances should be communicating outbound to a tour. So both of these are very high signal, very high impact finding types. The next one is the domain reputation finding. So these are relatively new. We released these uh, a few months back. And these are findings that come out of our machine learning and analytics group. And we built these based on our vast view of DNS data that we have access to. And we've trained these models to identify suspicious or potentially malicious domains based on that data. And in our practice, we've seen that oftentimes we're identifying malicious domains weeks sometimes prior to them ending up on actual uh, threat intelligence feeds. So these could be really good early indicators of talking to a compromised or otherwise uh, malicious domain. The next one is cryptocurrency. So today, right now, it, it does seem that turning instances into crypto miners, like resource hijacking, is one of the most common things that we see adversaries do if they get a foothold uh, within an instance. So the presence of crypto mining ac activity within your, your account is, is, again, a very high signal uh, that there's a problem with that particular instance. The EMR unprotected port probe is another one. So EMR cl clusters should really never be a, on a public internet, right? And we do have a feature with EMR that you can block that with EMR block public access, which I would recommend that you enable. But if you have not, what this finding is telling you is that you've placed your EMR master node with a public IP and left its security group open and it's being probed. And again, these instances have no business really being on a public internet. And so it's something that's very easy to correct and something that you should action on. The next one is our denial of service findings. So again, this is probably second to crypto mining as far as uh, adversarial actions once they compromise a particular instance. If they're not going to use it for crypto mining, a lot of times they'll try to use it uh, as part of denial of service attacks. And this last one might seem kind of out of place because it's, it's not really related to any sort of an active compromise. However, it's really one of my biggest pet peeves and it, it's, a, it's a frustrating because we have been telling customers for many, many years to not use your root credentials uh, broadly. These should be break glass credentials that are used in very limited uh, conditions and that when they are used, there's an audit trail of them. So this is a good example of a low priority finding that you should really definitely take action on because within GuardDuty, this is a policy finding, so it's, it's not an active threat. So it's, it comes in as a low severity However, if those credentials are compromised, they have full control over the account. 
And again, there's no good reason that those should be leveraged, especially in scripts or automation. And so if you see one of these, this is a good opportunity to have a runbook that's going to contact that account owner and understand why they're doing this and how you can move them to an IAM role as, instead of using the root credentials. So the next part of operationalizing findings I want to talk about is our new anomaly findings. So we had anomaly findings earlier in, in the GuardDuty product. And earlier this year, we re-released these anomaly findings based on some newer, more advanced models. And they addressed some of the key feedback that we got from customers about these findings, which was it was difficult for customers before to understand what was unusual. Why, why did we get this finding? And so as part of this new release, we added a whole bunch of context that tells the user exactly what it was we saw was unusual, and also importantly, what we expected to see. So what was normal for this user, and, and why did we determine that this was sufficiently anomalous? But it's important to understand that it's entirely possible that that activity was sufficiently unusual, but actually still benign. So one strategy here, again, if you're using detective, you can use that to dive deeper into that activity and understand what did that user do before and after and also see some additional baseline activity for what is typically seen for that user. But from an automation strategy, there's a couple things that you can do that are kind of low-hanging fruit. Again, because now we're adding a lot of this additional context, one area to look at is, is, is the source of that usual for me? Right? Is the ASN or the country where that's coming from usual for that user? Um, also, it could be that it's coming from a country where you just really shouldn't have your users operating from. So that could be a good, good signal. And then also one of the other things that we added from the context is what were the set of APIs that we saw that user interface with? And how does that relate to what is normally seen? Including are the, were those calls successful or did they fail? And again, so if you're seeing like failed calls to sensitive APIs like an IAM, that could be a signal that someone doesn't really understand what the credentials they have are meant to do and are trying, uh, just trying certain commands. But lastly, I think the, the best way to handle this is to implement these through a workflow that communicates back to the user. If anyone's ever gotten like a push alert or an SMS notification from your credit card company like where they say, hey, we're seeing unusual activity on your card. This is the same kind of workflow that we've seen some customers build that is very effective for these. And it's really important too because your, your traditional SOC analyst probably has no idea whether or not that's normal unless it falls into one of those earlier categories I spoke about. So pushing these directly to the user that's impacted, uh, we've seen some good examples by using Slack, for example, with a Slack workflow that allows the user to get a message, ask them if this was them, and if yes, then it simply closes the alert, and if no, then you would escalate that onto your, your incident response team. So I wanna talk a little bit now also about Security Hub. So Security Hub does a, has two, two main features. The first one is it aggregates findings across lots of different services in a common format we call ASFF. But the other and other key part of that is checking for best practices. And we released our foundational security best practice uh, check set, which has now 159 different checks across a large number of services, and that's gonna continue to grow over time. And this was in response to our customers asking us to be more opinionated about the most secure way to implement our services. Right. One of the benefits of AWS is the flexibility that we give developers, but the, we were also getting feedback from the security teams is that's great, but we want you to tell us what the right way in your view to, to use these services are. And so this is our means of doing that in a scalable way. And these checks are developed in concert with the service teams themselves, as well as security engineers, both on, within ESS and on the, the, secure, the service team. So a lot of times if you've implemented all these best practices, you can sometimes prevent or at least mitigate the impact of a particular event. There's a lot of security uh, automation that can be done for certain configuration findings. So if there's certain events like opening security groups to the entire internet on high sensitive ports or making buckets public, that maybe you have a policy that this should never happen. These are again, low hanging fruit for things that you can just automatically identify and immediately remediate while notifying the user that this happened. For things that don't fall into that category, and this is where the automation runbooks come into play, and that's using the, the customs action feature to invoke an automated response. So it might not be that you want a completely automated response like with a configuration change, but if you wanna take action on an instance to do a quarantine or isolate it or do something to a user's policy, 
you don't want to have somebody have to go do that manually. The customs action feature here allows you to have a set of predefined runbooks that an operator can execute and do so through that automation. And you, now you know it'll happen exactly the same way uh, each and every time, and it'll obviously also happen a lot quicker than if they were to try to do that manually. And that brings into one of the other key features of the ASFF format, the Amazon Security Finding Format. We have integrations with over 71 different third-party partner tools, and they all communicate their findings into Security Hub in the identical format, the same format that we use to send guard duty findings, for example, into Security Hub. And what this means is by putting those automation runbooks in Security Hub through the customs actions, if the action you want to take, for example, it, to do an isolation on an instance, you can use that same runbook and automation in response to a third, uh, one of our partner's endpoint tools as you would from a guard duty finding. So that consolidation and normalization of security findings allows you, again, to, to use those same automations across both our, our services and our partner tools. And it also makes it easier if you're going to output that into some thir a third party SIM or a different analytics tool as well. And then uh, the last one I want to touch on is ticketing. So we, you know, we have, uh, we've said a lot quite often at AWS that everything at Amazon is a ticket, right? If it's a, if it's a, a broken vending machine or the website is down, it's still a ticket. So we, we like ticketing. And if you think back to a lot of those low priority or otherwise configuration related issues, maybe on a non-production account, ticketing might be the right answer. And again, if you followed those best practices, then you have the ability to understand who owns that account, who's responsible for it, Creating a ticket might be the right way to do that. And with Security Hub, we have integrated with two partners for bi-directional ticketing support. So with Jira and ServiceNow, we can have the automation take that finding and send it to the, our partner's tools for ticketing and have it routed directly to the owner of that resource. And this is bi-directional. When they action on that ticket and close it out, we'll check to make sure that they actually you know, did perform the action, and it'll close the finding on the Security Hub side as well. So that bi-directionality helps close the loop there. And with that, now I'm going to bring up Bill Shin to talk about the AWS security operations teams. Thanks, Ryan, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, Ryan talked a lot about the tools and, and processes and automation you can use to, to automate incident response and, and to uh, follow the best practices of, of securing your AWS accounts. Uh, today, I'm going to talk a little bit more about our security operations teams uh, and particularly how customers can uh, evolve the security operations teams in, in, in their environment to help uh, you know, mitigate any possible security issues. So uh, who we are. So I work in AWS Security, but we also operate a specialized uh, team of customer incident response folks that, that assist and advise customers uh, during their active security events on a customer side of the AWS shared responsibility model. So this is a team of experienced AWS professional services and solution architects that have practiced an incident response. So sometimes if customers have an active security event, uh, they can contact AWS and we'll bring a team of solution architects to uh, to bear on the problem and help you uh, triage and, and, and assess the, the, the issue as it's, as it's happening. So we'll, we'll assist and advise customers uh, with active triage and recovery of their security events on AWS. We assist in root cause analysis. So the most important thing is understanding if you have a security issue, what was the root cause of that event? And making sure that you put preventative controls in place to make sure that doesn't happen again. Finally, we provide advice to customers for the long-term recovery for an active security event, whether that's um, you know, a simple guard duty finding or something 
uh, more significant, uh, we can help you advise and, and uh, prevent you know, issues in the future. So how do you escalate? Uh, we talk a lot about escalation in Amazon. It's a culture of healthy escalation. So when you have an, uh, an actual security event, the, the best path is for, for customers to triage this is to work and open an AWS support case of all tiers, whether that's developer support or business support or enterprise support. Uh, activating that AWS support case gets us in contact with you and the customer. The next step is to obviously uh, contact your AWS account team. So whether you are a single developer uh, working in, in a garage, building the next great startup, or a large enterprise, uh, you have an AWS account team. They're out there to help you, whether it's solution architects or technical account managers uh, or, your, or your account representative. The account team is there to help you. And if you're having an active security issue or a concern about security, by all means, please contact your AWS account team, either through the support case or directly through your, through your account team. And finally, if, if that triage happens and there's a, there's a need for us to en engage AWS security, the account team, including the technical account managers and the support functions, know how to get in touch with AWS security. And we'll make the determination whether to invoke an AWS customer incident response team to bring to bear and help you with your security issue. So that when that happens, the customer incident response team will validate the account ownership to make sure you know, that you have valid ownership over the account. Uh, we'll assist with the triage and the recovery uh, with the customer and with the AWS teams actively engaged. And we'll investigate the root cause uh, for that security event and provide recommendations for next steps. Just a reminder of the AWS shared responsibility model. Uh, one of the important things to remember is that all activities that occur under your account, including unauthorized access, happen in, in the portion of the customer's shared responsibility. Um, it's also important to properly configure and use AWS services. So we've talked a lot today about the security services and features like GuardDuty and Security Hub. It's also important in the, in the, the vast array of services that we offer uh, that, that each one of those has security documentation and a security page for each service that tells you how to properly configure that service. They're secure by default, but there's also additional features for lots of services like EC2 and RDS and S3 that have additional levels of logging or additional levels of preventive controls and policies you can apply to properly configure and use that AWS service. Keeping your account email and contact information is super important. So we've talked a lot about this today, but we can't emphasize it enough. If we need to reach you with regard to any active security issue, it's important that we keep that account email and, and have that email be a, a distribution list or a business email that goes to, uh, for example, a security operations function so that we can keep in touch with you and we can communicate about active security events. It's also the way we validate ownership is to make sure that we're in contact with you, that the appropriate parties have uh, the, the email address and contact information on file. Taking appropriate actions to secure and protect and back up your accounts is also part of the customer's shared responsibility model. We make a lot of services and features available to you to properly protect these things, things like what Ryan mentioned with Security Hub and the foundational security best practices, but also things like AWS backup or snapshots of, EC, of EBS volumes or RDS instances. All of those are fall into the customer's portion of shared responsibility. It's important to properly train and invest in the people building and working in AWS to make sure they're taking those appropriate actions. Ensuring that login credentials and access keys are not disclosed to unauthorized parties is a critical practice. Making sure that you don't check your, your credentials into a, a source code repository or share them with any other party except the owner of the account. So let's talk about some common root causes for customer security events. Well, very unlikely and infrequent, some of these things do occur. And the common, common root causes, so the first one really is not a, not a root cause of a security event per se, but it does complicate incident response and event triage. And, and again, emphasizing that account information is critically important. So if we have to notify you uh, through our trust and safety team or through uh, your account representatives or your support functions, having that accurate account information is critically important. That should be automated so that if someone receives that information, it should send a page or it should contact a, an on-call or an active security operations function. The other common root cause is, is incorrect uh, resource configuration and not following best practices. So we publish documentation for every service about the correct best practices. We offer automation through things like Security Hub and Trusted Advisor and AWS Config. 
uh, even uh, guardrails with the AWS Control Tower that, that provide you insights as to whether you're following those best practices. But not following those best practices around configuration is a common root cause. Things like overly permissive shares or, or overly scoped roles or incorrect security groups can come, be a common cause of uh, resource configurations that are not following best practices. The unintended disclosure of security credentials and secrets is also a common root cause. So we see that if someone shares their credentials, it might be accessed by an unauthorized party using credentials that are, that are not meant to be disclosed. Inadvertent response to guard duty and detective controls. So we fire alarms in guard duty. Uh, Ryan spoke about those earlier, about the severities and the different kinds of findings. But someone has to be looking at those. They should go to tickets, ideally, or at least a security operations function that can triage them and, uh, and determine whether it's an active security event or not. The lack of continuous vulnerability management. So it's a common practice in most international standards and, and industry standards that you have continuous vulnerability management. Uh, we offer things like inspector and systems manager to manage patching. Uh, and that's one way to manage vulnerability management is to keep the application software that's running in your environment secure and up to date. Uh, using things like systems manager, uh, using things like EC2 image builder to bake new AMIs, uh, using serverless functions where you're deploying code and those libraries and dependencies that you put into your applications, making sure that you're keeping those up to date in your repositories, as well as through the continuous integration and continuous deployment pipelines that are building and deploying into production. Let's talk a little bit about this bill of materials for incident response. So getting a, a guard duty event is one thing, but the, the host of services we offer around these things is super important for incident responders to learn and to, to understand as well. Uh, AWS organizations is one starting point. So when you have an AWS account, uh, there's a management account for the AWS organization uh, that allows you to apply policy to the, to the member accounts of that organization. It's a great way to prevent, to prevent uh, un unintended consequences or unintended actions using things like service control policies uh, or management policies that can push policy down to those member accounts and provide a bunch of preventative controls. Understanding those as an incident responder is very important so that you know what is, what is permissible and not permissible or what is expected and unexpected, but understanding those policies through things like organizations or identity and access management, things like permission boundaries, permission policies, the things that IAM offers you uh, gives you very comprehensive and flexible policies to make sure that the correct things are happening within your account. Ryan covered guard duty pretty well, so I won't go into detail on that, but CloudTrail is also very important. Uh, incident responders might not be the people who are necessarily building the workloads in AWS. Those are probably engineering or IT functions. But for an incident responder, you need to know what these alarms are and what these logs mean in CloudTrail. It's a comprehensive audit, uh, audit, audit, uh, uh, audit service for all of the API actions that are occurring in your account. So if you're launching an EC2 instance or changing a security group or creating a new user or creating a snapshot or changing the policy on a bucket, for example, in S3, all of that's going to happen in CloudTrail. And so as an incident responder and a security operations professional, it's important to know what those API calls mean. And so integrating that with something like an account, uh, account information store to know which accounts are production, who owns the account, you can take that and enrich that data from CloudTrail and provide meaning and context to the event as you're responding to any potential security issues. AWS Config might be one of my most favorite services. It's a, it's a change detection and drift detection service that takes a snapshot of resources in your AWS environment and tells you as those resources change over time. Uh, it's a, got a recorder of a, kind of the history of the resources in your account. And as an incident responder uh, or any kind of change management function, the first question you ask is what changed? Uh, and what, what is different about what our known good state was to a potentially unknown state where you may have an actual security event? AWS Config uh, provides that, that recorded history of the entire environment and is an invaluable tool in incident response. The other thing config offers is a set of rules. So the foundation of things like security hubs best practices or conformance packs or control towers guard, uh, guardrails is really con config rules at the core. Uh, it provides you the ability to test for compliance. So you state a known good state or a desired configuration state, and those rules run uh, in automated fashions to tell you if that desired configuration state changes. So config is an incredibly valuable tool in terms of incident response and measuring compliance with your known good state. 
Uh, Security Hub Ryan covered pretty well, so I won't go into that. But again, those those integrations are really important. The partner integrations on the input side uh, from from a, a, a large variety of partners from traditional uh, you know security vendors can provide inputs to Security Hub and then output those into actionable uh, actionable tools and actionable services that allow you to respond. AWS backup is also critically important. Knowing where your data is and what's backed up and in what state it's in, that it meets your recovery time or recovery point objectives. Uh, AWS backup lets you set policy in an organization-wide uh, uh, way to make sure that you're backing up data properly. AWS personal health dashboard is also very important. And it's important that the, the security teams work very closely with the engineering teams in their organization to make sure that you're getting the alarms and things that we're sending you notifications for in personal health dashboard uh, so that everyone shares that information throughout the enterprise. Uh, we'll send you important information about uh, version updates or, or issues with your account that you may want to pay attention to. Uh, Secrets Manager is also very important, and understanding that as an incident responder or a security operations function is critically important to know that where your credentials are stored. So Secrets Manager not only manages credentials for things like RDS instances, but also for API keys you want to store there, or any other secret that you need to manage. It's backed by KMS, so those secrets are encrypted at rest, and we provide things like automatic rotation. But knowing where credentials are used, so that if there is unauthorized access, you can trace those back. But the idea is to, re to absolutely remove fixed credentials where a human knows those. And Secrets Manager allows you to store a credential and essentially vault that in a way that allows you to rotate that credential automatically. So those are core services that are really important to security, uh, along with a, a list of other, uh, you know, host of other security services we offer. But these are the ones that incident responders should really know and understand and train and invest in learning these services. We'll talk about some other services, you know, some features within uh, different parts of these platforms. So Access Advisor and Access Analyzer allow you to know uh, what, what uh, permissions you're using in, in a particular role. So if you have a role that provides uh, access to, to you know, a number of APIs and a number of actions within those APIs, Access Advisor will tell you if you're not using those particular permissions. And as an incident responder or security operations professional, it's important to know that you can downscope those roles whenever possible. Access Advisor provides you lots of information about what's being used and what's not. And Access Analyzer tells you when you're using uh, sharing resources in an overly permissive way outside of your account or outside of your organization in a way that may be unintended. And those are events and things that, that Access Analyzer will find and send to Security Hub, for example, is something that a security operations team or incident responder needs to act on to make sure that you're downscoping those permissions and properly sharing uh, or limiting the shares on particular resources. Uh, I'll uh, step to IAM Policy Simulator. It allows you as a, as a uh, security practitioner to simulate what, uh, what will work and what will not will be allowed and denied when a particular IAM policy is applied to a principal. Uh, it's, a, it's a valuable tool to simulate uh, incident response and to, to use it in testing as well. And so understanding that's pretty important. The well-architected service is, is a white, set of white papers we launched a number of years ago. It uh, provides design principles and best practices, and we built it into a service in the console that you can use as a self-service way or with your AWS account team to walk through things like cost and resiliency, but most importantly, security, to make sure that you're designing your, your environment correctly according to our best practices. The well-architected service allows you to track the assessments that you're performing over time and, and is a way to, to identify issues that you might want to resolve and escalate to management, get resources invested, get people aligned. It's a really a planning tool and a way to assess uh, the accuracy of your environment with regard to our best practices. So we talked a lot about uh, temporary credentials as well, but this is one of the most powerful tools to know where you don't have to have fixed credentials, but being able to use temporary credentials instead, things like instance profiles or an execution role for a Lambda function or containers, things like that allows you to have services that call other AWS services without having fixed credentials, which removes the problem of, say, checking in credentials to a source code repository or having fixed credentials that a human has access to if these are constantly rotated on your behalf. Uh, the Reachability Analyzer from VPC is also a powerful tool to determine uh, what the, 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 the path through a network is. So that reachability looks at the, the definition of the network and the route tables and the security groups and tells you what is accessible, say, from the internet or from, a, from an untrusted network or a trusted network or from one VPC, uh, what, can get, what resources you can get to within that VPC. Uh, it's a powerful tool to know what the network path is in the case of a security issue. 
And finally, CloudWatch is another auditing platform that we have that a lot of the services integrate with that allows you to get uh, either custom logs or things from uh, the CloudWatch logs agent that allows you to put logs off of an operating system or an application into a scalable service like CloudWatch where you can analyze those logs and build filters and alarms off of those things in addition to CloudTrail. So let's talk a little bit about some resources here. So the security incident response simulation and security reference architecture. The security incident response simulation is something we practice with our customers. We offer it through professional services or your solution architecture team, and it's scenario-driven guidance for identifying common root causes of security events. This is not a tabletop exercise. They're important, but tabletops are very good for sourcing the, assessing the, the communication in an enterprise and making sure that everyone knows their roles and responsibilities. But there's nothing better than an actual scenario-driven guidance. So we'll work with you to set up test accounts or even use your, your actual accounts to provide uh, simulated security events so that we can test the actual muscle and exercise the tooling and the automation and the response across the entire enterprise. Uh, it's very important to practice this. It's not just something you can do in a tabletop or talk about. You actually have to test that muscle before something happens. They're grounded in real-world security events experienced by AWS customers. So things that you see in Guard Duty, for example, will simulate those. Uh, Guard Duty also offers a test harness, so it allows you to test, uh, fire test events from Guard Duty to, to make sure that you know before those events would actually happen in a real environment, that you're able to test those and make sure the ticketing works and that people respond and pagers go off and that people follow the incident response process. But these simulations we offer with customers can be everything from uh, you know, PR and, and up to legal, but also actual you know, testing and mitigation and containment and how to build tooling and run books for every kind of imaginable security event. They offer prescriptive guidance on how to prevent and detect. So when we do a simulation, uh, we do it after action review. Uh, we, we, look, we bring all the teams back together and we learn how to, how to prevent those in the future and also how to detect what was missed or maybe uh, go to root cause on, on which part of the incident response process might need improvement. These reduce customer security risks to their database accounts and their resources. So they're applicable to all customers in their existing architectures. Um, the core AWS services to start with, this is in the security reference architecture that we recently launched. So this, this reference architecture is, uh, there's a blog post about it, there's a white paper about it, and it's an actual uh, open, it's a repository in AWS Labs with cloud formation templates that help you get started in launching all the security services and properly configuring them. It's a, it's a canonical security reference architecture. Uh, it involves uh, everything from AWS organizations and the proper account design to the security services like Security Hub and, and Guard Duty. So that security reference architecture is out there. I encourage everyone to take a look and, and download the documentation and take a look at the cloud formation templates. Again, it's a, it's a reference architecture, so you'll probably tailor it to your environment, but it's a great place to start if you're just wondering how to get started to build the correct security architecture, uh, setting you up for success with incident response. So it's prioritized. The security uh, reference architecture, the, the first version that's out there, is something we'll iterate on and we'll continue to grow. We, we invite active contribution and feedback. Um, there's mechanisms within that, that security reference architecture documentation to get a hold of us and to provide new inputs and ideas on how to make it and improve it. Uh, but it's basically prioritized to the critical security practices uh, observed that we've observed to prevent and detect security issues. So we'll do a, a little top 10, uh, really focused on incident response. Uh, again, ensure that you have defined a strategy for incident response. It's important that it's somebody's day job, and it's something you want to figure out before you need to. So having someone who's actually on the hook, and it's, it's their roles and responsibilities, uh, including the people part of it, so training people, making sure they have the resources they need, and that they have time and, and training to exercise and to simulate responses before they actually need to. Uh, again, using the business e email distributions for your account information is very critically important. You know, configuring backups with AWS Backup or other uh, mechanisms like snapshots, uh, life cycles and versioning and things like Glacier and Vault Lock and other things uh, that can back up your critical resources for data. And periodically, more importantly, is to verify the restores of the backups and that they're priority of the restore order to make sure you can resume business operations in the case of an event. 
We want to ensure that you're enabling guard duty, config, security hub, and cloud trail, and the audit logs for each security service so that you have telemetry and you have visibility into what's happening uh, to make sure that if there is a security event, you're not wondering what happened because you didn't have the logs enabled. Uh, making sure that these logs are turned on and they're going to a correct place where you can search them and they're archived, uh, and that's something that you have to do kind of up front. So assess the risk continuously for critical and high severities for common uh, misconfigurations. So using the AWS Security, uh, Security Hub Foundational Best Practices allows you to identify critical and high severity findings for common misconfigurations, uh, as well as the, the uh, severity of findings that go into Security Hub from either partner tools or the variety of AWS services that feed into that. So continually assessing for least privilege. So as you create more and more uh, workloads in AWS, not just the human users who you may federate into AWS through, say, an identity provider, and you assume a role in AWS, uh, making sure that those are certainly least privileged as well. But as you build workloads, you may have roles associated with compute or things like uh, Lambda or containers. Uh, making sure those roles are, are properly scoped and continuously with least privilege. We've announced some great things in the last couple of months. Uh, certainly this, this entire year has been a, a, a big uh, you know, push for policy validation and things like uh, you know, uh, being able to look at the history of CloudTrail and build a, a least privilege policy based on that um, are features you should absolutely be using to make sure you have least privilege for, for identity roles. Uh, really focus on replacing long-lived credentials with short-lived credentials. This is an easy thing to assess. Uh, basically, anywhere where a human is providing a credential or using a fixed credential is, an, is a should go in somebody's backlog. Uh, there's always an opportunity to uh, use things like uh, Systems Manager to connect to EC2 instances or to reduce uh, you know, fixed, fixed credentials that you might instead store in, in uh, Secrets Manager or things like instance profiles and being able to provide short-lived, uh, short constantly rotated credentials uh, to reduce the, uh, the risk of security events uh, happening with fixed credentials. Uh, finally, implement the OS top 10. So this is uh, you know, something we, we provide uh, at a AWS uh, web application firewall. Uh, there's other methodologies to implement this, but basically if you're putting something on the internet, uh, make sure you're validating input and you have rate limits uh, for applications and, and code within AWS services. So you, you provide your, your code and your workload that goes onto our services. It's important to do vulnerability assessment and penetration testing, but with, an, with a focus on the OS top 10 is a quick win. Uh, again, routinely patch to the latest security vulnerabilities for uh, your operating systems. If you build EC2 images, you can use Image Builder. You can uh, basically make an AMI factory to constantly uh, rebake and redeploy those, those operating systems. Uh, again, for your applications as well, the idea would be to have those in a source code repository and deployed through a pipeline, uh, making sure those, those things are patched before they go out. So having a, a process for vulnerability assessment, static code analysis, uh, being able to put those into your pipelines before applications are deployed. And then making sure you're looking at the dependencies too. So if you have a, say, a Lambda function or, a, or any kind of code that takes a dependency on a library, make sure you have provenance of that code and that you're looking at dependencies on software that you might need to patch and update. Finally, routinely train and simulate for cloud security events. So nobody wants to have a bad day, and then as infrequent as it is, uh, practicing for this before it happens is, is a very important concept. So making sure that you know, if you're the incident responder, you're getting the resources you need, and you have the ability to practice and train and make sure there's awareness across the organization of how to respond to a security event. It's an iterative process. It's not a one-time project. We're never done with security. It's a constantly changing environment. Uh, not only the business environment that's changing and growing, but also the, the regulatory environment and, and the, the landscape on the internet is constantly changing. So it's important to evolve and continually practice. And we'll put some references up here to the top 10 uh, that Steve has mentioned in his keynotes. Uh, the security pillar for well-architected, uh, the reference architecture that I discussed, as well as the incident response guide that's a white paper that's available to you. These lessons learned. So enjoy the benefits of responding to the, in the cloud with the cloud. So making sure that you are using the automation and the APIs available to you uh, to respond to incidents. Teams of builders make the best incident responders. So the people who know the workloads the best are the people who built it. And it's important to engage them in incident response. Train how you respond. So again, practicing and practicing and call on us to help you with security incident response simulations is something we make available to you. And create a culture of inspection. Uh, basically, you expect what you inspect. So having that visibility and telemetry and training is very important. And finally, creating a culture of escalation, of healthy escalation. It's much better to escalate something and have it de-escalated by your security organization than to miss something. So we, escalation is very important, and we encourage it. So again, thank you very much. And uh, 
go build. And thank you very much.